Okay, so the third case study is um, a series on human exploration in space. We are just going to focus on the regime of low Earth orbit. So of which there have been a few space stations in low Earth orbit that I wanted to point out. Just a little history lesson. So on the left, we've got Skylab. Uh, Skylab was the first United States space mission launched by NASA, occupied for about 24 weeks between May 1973 and February 1974. It was operated by three separate three astronaut crews, Skylab 2, Skylab 3, and Skylab 4. On July 11, 1979, Skylab made a spectacular return to Earth, breaking up in the atmosphere and showering burning debris over the Indian Ocean in Australia. The next space station I want to talk about, uh, we all should recognize, called the International Space Station, or the ISS. The ISS is a modular space station in low Earth orbit. It is a multinational collaborative project involving five participating space agencies. NASA, Roscosmos, JAXA, ESA, and the CSA. Um, sorry, I should probably say which countries those are from. So Roscosmos is from Russia, JAXA is Japan, ESA is Europe as a community, and CSA is Canada, not China. The ownership and use of the space station is established by intergovernmental treaties and agreements. It launched in November 20th of 1998, and is still operating today. The station serves as a microgravity and space environment research laboratory in which scientific research is conducted in astrobiology, astronomy, meteorology, physics, and other fields. The ISS is suited for testing the spacecraft systems and equipment required for possible future long duration missions to the moon and Mars. On the bottom right is a rendering of Tiango, which is um, Chinese, officially the Tiangong Space Station. It's a space station constructed by China in low Earth orbit between 340 and 450 kilometers above the surface. This is China's first long-term space station. It is the third goal in the third step of the China Manned Space Program. Once completed, the Tiangong Space Station will have a mass between 80 and 100 tons uh, which is going to be roughly one fifth of the mass of the International Space Station and about the size of the decommissioned Russian Mir Space Station. It launched in April of 2021, which was less than a year ago. And it was spurred on because 10 years ago, NASA refused Chinese participation in the ISS in 2011, which has some ethical implications, if I can say so. So the ISS is. Here is a commemorative plaque of all the different countries that are involved. So earlier we were talking about CSA, uh, ESA, which includes these countries. Then there was JAXA, Roscosmos, NASA. And then Brazil also participated, but just between these years. You can see that there, is, there are a lot of humans who are in space and the ISS has been continuously inhabited here we see flight engineers Christina Koch, Koch and Jessica Meyer. Um, and I believe that they were the first female spacewalk, which happened in 2011. All female spacewalk. And then on the bottom right is um, STS 131 and Expedition 23 crew members. And the reason why I put this picture in here is because this may be one of the crews that had the most amount of people in the ISS at any one time. Okay, so there are a lot of people. There are rules among these people about how to behave, uh, a code of conduct for the International Space Station crew. The scope and the content for this code of conduct is here and you should have read it. So. Um, it's to establish a clear chain of command, to establish a clear relationship between ground and on orbit, establish a management hierarchy, set forth standards for um, work and activities in space, establish responsibilities with respect to elements and equipment, set forth disciplinary regulations, 
establish physical and information security guidelines, and then define the ISS commander's authority and responsibility to enforce safety. Now, the general rules of conduct, there actually aren't that many. So there is a ton of room for uh, gray space in how to interpret these. So in bold, I just have the summary of the general rules of conduct. Crew members shall maintain a harmonious and cohesive relationship and an appropriate level of mutual confidence and respect. No ISS crew member shall give undue preferential treatment to any other person or reflect unfavorably their activities or their partners to, um, to the outside world. And ISS crew members shall protect and conserve all property to which they have access on the ISS. So a question could be, where did this code of conduct come from? Um, the closest approximation to this code until then was a standards of conduct agreement, which a mission specialist sent by a foreign organization, such as ESA for training in the United States, was required to sign before being assigned to a specific US space shuttle flight. The main purposes of this document, where this code of conduct came from, was to obtain the person's consent to be subject to the authority, orders and direction of the commander, and to limit the disclosure of data which are protected and to refrain from using his or her position or information obtained in the course of mission for personal gain. Okay, so I thought another question that could be asked was, who are the people going up into space? So this touches on the question of astronaut selection and training. Um, astronauts have been sent uh, astronauts have been selected on the basis of their neurological composition. So a huge disqualifier is any predisposed illnesses um, or neurotic issues. Beneficial traits of astronauts include flexibility, ability to adapt, tolerance, and good social skills. The selection process is very rigorous. Only 10 new astronaut candidates came from an application pool of 12,000. The astronauts have to pass a physical examination, which is pretty rigorous. And minimum qualifications include a bachelor's degree in um, some STEM fields, followed by three years of professional experience or 1,000 hours of piloting experience. Now, once they're selected, um, Still, it's a hard path forward. Most astronauts don't make it to space, uh, but all of them have to train. They have to learn about the systems that they'll be working with in space. They'll have to learn how to work with one another and how to manage themselves in a confined environment. Uh, the astronauts are put under isolation, stress, and through dangers of a space mission. There is cross-cultural training, and there's also survival training, language, and technical skill training. Um, here is the most recent astronaut cohort from 2013. And fun fact, this was the first class to be evenly split between male and female candidates. It just happened in 2013, which blows my mind. Um, and then here, on the bottom right, what I want to show is the national composition, so the extreme diversity that can be represented in the International Space Station. So across gender, across nationality, there needs to be tolerance for differences. Um, and beyond that, there needs to be encouragement for cooperation and collaboration. Okay. So it would be remiss uh, to not mention the rise of space tourism. This is probably one of the most unique parts of our recent generation. So since 1960, we've mostly seen space dominated by governments, but now we're seeing that um, companies can access space like we were just talking about Elon Musk. Um, there are some other notable <laughs> rich people who are making it to space like Jeff Bezos here and Richard Branson. But here we have companies like Virgin Galactic, which has a space plane and they can fly tourists in these little seats into uh, past the Von Karman line. 
Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin company can send um, civilians to space in a little capsule. Uh, another milestone recently is that a Japanese billionaire seen here entered the International Space Station. Uh, let's see, the here shown is a Russian media crew filming a movie on the ISS. And then here is, for example, this guy. Um, what is his name? Isn't he in uh, Star Trek, this actor? Anyway, he made it into space. Even he made it to space. Um, okay. And then here is an image of Starship, which is a rocket built by SpaceX, which is also hoping to enter this field of space tourism. So very exciting. Okay. Now I was curious. Yes, William Shatner. Thank you, Caitlin. So I was curious. What is the composition of these civilians who are getting to go into space who are not officially going through the NASA astronaut program? So here I'm just taking a little case study, a little profile of the people who made it to space through unconven unconventional channels. So in the back, we've got um, Jared, Jared Isaacman, who is a billionaire. He was the one who chartered Inspiration4, which was a SpaceX mission. And he was the commander of the Inspiration4 mission. Then we have Haley, who was a physician assistant at St. Jude in Memphis. And I thought it was fascinating how these people were chosen. So instead of through some application process, there are a lot of fundraisers and crowdsourced efforts. Um, and because this mission was chartered by Jared, he had a lot of control over the like fundraising campaign. And so St. Jude was one of those uh, pillars that he wanted to support. So Haley came from St. Jude, Chris Zembrowski, he was a data engineer who won through a fundraiser sweepstakes, also meant to support St. Jude. He became the payload science experiments, communications to mission control um, point of contact. And then Sean Proctor is a geology and planetary science professor and science communication specialist. She was awarded her seat as the winner of the shift or shop competition. And she was the pilot. Now, Inspiration4 only spent three days in orbit. Uh, they did not have any training in space station systems or spacewalks, but they did go through some form of NASA approved training for space flight, which um, tested Professor, their- I have a question. Sure, just one second. Which tested uh, their ability with dealing with gravitational forces and they also simulated isolated challenging environments. Okay, Matthew, what's up? How could a geology professor be a pilot? or if they weren't given any special training. So isn't like the requirement like 400 hours in a, um, I guess, not a supersonic aircraft, but there's like a certain speed rating for the aircraft, not to mention the training like the T2 plus other additional training, or was it like automated and they just called her the pilot for style? Yeah, I mean, I don't know her background, but it's very likely that she had some piloting experience. And then also remember that they are not held to the same rigor as NASA or the Department of Defense. Like this guy chartered the flight and selected people based off of methods that I, you know, that NASA doesn't follow. So I have similar questions as you. Maybe that's something that we should talk about in the discussion. Oh no, Caitlin, I was just asking if she, it said they weren't given any special training. It doesn't, doesn't list like pilot training. And so I mean, that's what I was asking. Anyone can uh, can go to a, pri a, a, pri a private uh, pilot to get a private pilot license. I know, but I'm asking, did she? There's I'm not, not sure about her background. Yeah. Yeah. So you can look it up if you're curious. I'm sure you'll find it faster than me. But also, a part of 
these space tourism experiences is that things should be easier. Like the technology should have improved such that your qualifications don't need to be as high. Something else I was noticing about the rules, um, the training of astronauts in the past was very rigorous and militaristic and they didn't have that much freedom. Uh, Anti-vaxxers wouldn't do very well in get, trying to get into this program um, because they, they want freedom. And, but, and so it would seem that the astronaut training, it was a constrained thing because they're sending people out into a totally strange environment and they want to have control from the ground to not have bad things happen. Now tourists are going out. So tourists are not going to put up with that. Um, so they're going to be, the rules are going to get looser. And you might project that into the future that as space travel builds up and we have tourists going and people with private rockets that um, things are going to be a lot looser for them. Guys, jump in the gun. Well, th I that was my last slide anyway. So yeah, let's start our discussion. Um, oh, well, we, the conduct question, uh, that fits what I just said. Exactly. So I'm going to stop the recording and we're just going to have at it. Okay. Oh, okay, fine. Take it away.